Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our weekly recap of our chronological reading through the Bible. Following the presentation of the scriptures chronologically as we find them in the Reese Chronological Bible. This week finishes week number 22, uh, the first weekend in June, today being the 4th of June in 2022. This particular week that we're just finishing has covered about 30 to 35 years of time in the history of the divided kingdom of northern Israel and southern Judah. And as we, we began our reading this week, we saw that there was a brief period of time when there was peace between the king of Israel, Ahaziah, or the king of Israel and the king of Judah. Jehoshaphat was the king of southern Judah and Ahaziah was the king of northern Israel. For a period of time, there was peace between them. Remember that the kingdom was divided after the death of Solomon at the beginning of the reign of his son, Rehoboam. Jeroboam I became the king over northern Israel and there were 10 tribes that were associated with northern Israel. Rehoboam was the king over southern Judah and there were two tribes associated with that, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. What we will find as we work our way through the remainder of the Old Testament, especially when the southern kingdom of Judah goes into captivity to Babylon and we read through the prophecies of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, that there will come a time way out into the future when the Lord will bring back the people of Israel who will have been scattered over all the earth and to every nation. And he will bring them back into the land of Israel and they will be one nation again, not divided. And we'll read some specific prophecies about that when we get into Ezekiel. If we think about the prophecies that were made then, which we'll put in a ballpark figure of 575 to 600 BC, we fast forward to where we are in 2022. We see that indeed in the last 73 years or 74 years now, God has been bringing the people of the nation of Israel, the Jewish people back to the land of Israel from all around the globe more and more every year. It used to be that there were more Jews in New York City than there were in the nation of Israel, in the land of Israel. That's not the case anymore. So we see that without our realizing it sometimes, the prophecies that God gave to us in the Old Testament are actually being brought about in our lifetime before our very eyes. But back to this week's reading, we began reading with these two kings in northern Israel and southern Judah having a, a, a bit of relief between the animosity on both sides. Part of that was because of there had been some intermarriage that will even cause some problems to the southern kings as we read about in this week's reading. We read about this man, Elijah, the prophet that had been sent to northern Israel we also will begin reading this week, or we began reading this week, about Elisha, the prophet who would follow Elijah. He also will be sent to northern Israel. And interesting to me is that neither one of those prophets were what we would call writing prophets. They gave tremendous uh, prophecy, worked tremendous miraculous deeds, but they did not write anything that ended up in our canon of scripture. So we read early in the week about Elijah calling down fire from heaven to destroy uh, an army captain and his 50 soldiers that were sent by the king of Israel to get him. And he did that twice. And then the third captain of 50 that came, uh, realizing what had happened to the previous two groups, asked for mercy from Elijah and God instructed Elijah to go with him and God 
had Elijah to show mercy to that man and he did not destroy him and he went back with him. And so then Elijah began to prepare for his translation in some subheadings in study Bibles and in the Reese Chronological Bible. It spoke about Elijah's translation. We would call it Elijah's rapture in our day in that he was taken up from earth without dying physically. But Elijah was preparing for his, his translation and Elisha was the one that had been selected by God and Elijah had gone by Elisha and cast his mantle on his shoulder, giving an official commission or calling to him to become his understudy or apprentice. And he did that. And we noticed that this week, when it was apparent to Elisha that his mentor, Elijah, would be taken from him. And there were other prophets in those days that we don't know the names of that were also aware of that was about to happen. And Elisha was asked a question, what would you have me to do for you before I am translated? That was Elijah's question to Elisha. And Elisha asked what we might consider to be a strange thing. It wasn't strange to him. It was deep in his heart. He asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit to be put upon him. In measuring terms, we could say he was asking to be able to perform twice as many miracles and prophecies as what his mentor Elijah had done. So Elisha's ministry began he was able to see when Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind and the fiery chariot and he picked up the mantle that was dropped by Elijah when he went up into the heavens and he rolled it together and we saw that when he went back to the Jordan River, uh, he touched the Jordan River with Elijah's mantle and it parted and he walked across and so that was the beginning of his ministry and if you happen to have the reading notes that I have made, at least in the last couple of years, you may have noticed in the side margins that whenever there would be a prophecy or a miracle that Elisha did, I began to number them to see whether or not he did twice as many as what Elijah did. And we'll see how that comes out as we progress through our reading in the next few days or weeks. Well, Elisha was asked for uh, a word of God and he was brought before three kings. There was a time when uh, the Moabites were going to fight against northern Israel and southern Judah and also uh, against Edom. And the, three, the kings of those three countries came together to go to battle against the Moabites. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, wanted to know if they could get a word from the Lord, if there was a prophet there. And so Elisha was summoned and Elisha told the three kings that if it wasn't for the respect that he had for Jehoshaphat being the king of southern Judah, he wouldn't even come and answer their questions. But he indicated to them that God would provide for them the victory over the Moabites. And uh, so that did happen. So that was another one of those prophecies that would be considered a miracle that Elisha was able to perform. We see that Elisha was sent to a Shunammite woman, a widow woman, and she had a son and was preparing a last meal because of this drought and the famine that had come across the land. And Elisha told her to first fix him a meal and then fix herself one. And she said that she only had enough oil in the house. And so he instructed her to borrow as many vessels as she could from her neighbors and to fill those vessels with the jar of oil that she had because a miracle would happen. And as she would begin to pour from her jar into those larger vessels, into many of the vessels that she could borrow, the oil never ran out of her jar until she came to the point of filling the last of that jars that she borrowed and then the oil stopped and so then she was able to sell some and 
live off of the proceeds from that. He made a prophecy that the Shunammite woman uh, would have a son the following year, and she did. And then we read about Jehoram being the bad king that walked in the ways of the kings of Israel that followed after Jehoshaphat, after Jehoshaphat died. Then we read of the Shunammite woman's son dying, and then Elisha bringing him back to life again from the dead. And the month of May ended up with our reading of more numerous miracles that were done by Elisha. One in particular was the healing of a leprous man who was in the army of Syria. His name was Naaman. And he had a slave girl who was a Jewish slave girl. And she made comment to her uh, mistress or to the woman of the house, Naaman's wife, that if only they were in Israel, Naaman could go to the prophet there and be healed. Well, the king of uh, Syria sent Naaman and a lot of goods and money and so forth with him to Israel to see if he could be healed. And Elisha gave him the instruction to go and dip himself seven times in the Jordan River. Elisha didn't even come out to see Naaman face to face, but he sent his servant out to tell him that. Servant's name was Gehazi. And uh, Naaman at first was rather, rather put off about the whole situation. And one of his soldiers encouraged him, if the prophet had told you some great feat to do, you no doubt would have done all you could to have accomplished that, but here he gives you something simple, so why don't you at least try it? And we know the story how that he went and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan River and he became uh, clean from his leprosy and his skin was uh, clean and smooth like a baby's skin. And in great gratitude, he came back to speak with the prophet and tried to offer him money and clothing and goods and Elisha wouldn't take it. And so he sent him back on his way towards Syria. And I believe that that man became a believer in the one true God. And he asked that he be granted the ability to take a bunch of dirt on a pack mule back to the land of Syria so that he would have dirt to kneel upon when he was forced to be with his king. And his king would kneel to his pagan idols Naaman wanted to be able to kneel on dirt that came from Israel, signifying that he believed in the one true God. And so he did that. And then we read how that Gehazi, Elisha's servant, got to thinking about, wow, there was an opportunity for us to have some money and some extra clothing and some uh, nice things from Naaman. And Elisha wouldn't take any of it. So he went in secret uh, and caught up with Naaman on his way back to Syria and told him a lie, said that there had been some servants or young understudies that came to Elisha and that he had been sent to ask if he could have some clothing and maybe a little bit of finances to provide for the needs of those guys who really hadn't come and Eli or Gehazi was just making that up. Well, he was given plenty of stuff to take and when he got back and put it away, trying to keep it away from Elisha's knowing about it, uh, he hadn't thought through the process very well because Elisha, being God's prophet, was aware of what he had done. And so then Elisha pronounced a judgment upon Gehazi and said that he would become leprous in place of Naaman and that people of his family would always have someone who was leprous. And so we see that uh, disobedience and not following after God's will had consequences in his life. Well, we saw at the beginning of the reading in June, the first day of June, that we began going through the minor prophets. And the first one that we read through was Obadiah, that one chapter book. There's three or four or five books in the Bible that are made up of just one chapter. And Obadiah is one of them in the Old Testament. And that was a 
uh, prophecy that Obadiah gave about judgment upon Edom. Some Bible scholars have said that Edom and the Edomites have more prophecies and judgments spoken about them than any other group of people in Scripture. I don't know if that's uh, the case or not, but they certainly have a lot of judgment words spoken against them. Remember that Edom and the Edomites came from Esau, and Esau was the twin brother of Jacob. Esau was the one who sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob is the one whose name was changed to Israel. So Edom, or Esau, was a brother of Jacob, who was the father of the 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. So the Edomites were related to the Israelites, but they became bitter enemies of them all the way through the history of the Edomites. When we get into the New Testament and we study about King Herod, we will learn that he was an Edomite. And ironically, the Roman Empire that was in power at the time of Jesus' birth and ministry thought that they were going to be doing the Jews a favor by putting Herod over them because they thought that he was a Jew because he was related to them. When in fact, they put someone who was a bitter enemy, at least he and his ancestors were, towards the Israelites. And remember that King Herod is the one that tried to kill all the babies two years of age and under in the area around Bethlehem and Ramah when the wise men from the east had come and asked him where this child was born, king of the Jews. So kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but we come back now to our reading this week and we see that another miracle that Elisha did was when he and his servant were at Dothan and the Syrian army surrounded the city. And in early in the morning when Gehazi, his servant, went out to get the animals ready for them to go. And he looked up on the hillside around the circumference of the city of Dothan and he saw a great Syrian army there. And he about had a panic attack. And he asked Elisha, what are we going to do? And Elisha very calmly uh, prayed and asked God to open it. Gehazi's eyes that he might see and all of a sudden his eyes were opened and he was able to see into a dimension in which you and I have never seen which apparently from time to time Elisha was able to see or at least be aware of and in this particular instance as an answer to Elisha's prayer Gehazi was able to see into this dimension where he saw the great host of God's army angelic host that were greater in number and larger than the Syrian army surrounding them. And it gave him calmness and <laughs> relieved him from his almost panic attack. And we saw how that then Elisha prayed and this Syrian army was smitten with blindness. And he actually led them uh, to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel asked Elisha, should we kill them? And he said, no, you feed them make a banquet for them, and then send them home. And so then for a period of time, the kings and the armies of Syria didn't come against Israel any longer for at least a period of time. Well, we see that uh, uh, back in uh, southern Judah, Elisha was going to be anointing Jehu to become king over northern Israel. So it wasn't back in southern Judah, but there in Israel, there was this man named Jehu. And uh, we probably, at least when I was growing up, little kid on the farm, every once in a while, when there would be an animal act up, uh, dad or one of the uncles would say something about you, Jehu. And it was a negative connotation to that there's this man named Jehu that's going to be anointed uh, to become the king over Israel. And he's given instruction from God through the prophet that he is to destroy all the family of Ahab, the evil king who had been married to Jezebel in northern Israel. And so he goes about doing that. And God is going to bless him for that and tell him, we'll read in next week's reading, that he will 
have a descendant to sit on the throne for four generations. So uh, Jehu went and fought against Jehoram, the king of Israel, and he also fought against Ahaziah, who had replaced Jehoshaphat and Jehoram after they had died as kings of Judah. And both of those kings were killed. And that's how we discover that this wicked lady named Athaliah became the queen over southern Judah. And she tried to do away with the king's line, and she tried to destroy all the descendants of her son who had been killed by Jehu because she wanted to be the queen. And I believe that that was a satanic ploy similar to what we have seen through the history of man after the calling of Abraham and the beginning of the Jewish nation, a satanic effort to do away with all Jews. We've even seen that in our lifetime at the end of World War II. And so I think that it's satanically motivated and driven. But God is always going to make sure that his prophecies and his promises will be fulfilled and come true. And God provided uh, a woman named Jehosheba, the daughter of the former king Jehoram, to uh, be able to spare a young son named Joash, who was a descendant of Ahaziah, and hide him so that Athaliah was not able to kill all of the descendants that could have risen to the throne who were direct descendants of David. So God's making sure that his prophecy will be fulfilled. Well, then we read about Jehu destroying the prophets of Baal, the worshipers of Baal in Israel. However, we read that Jehu did not depart from the ways of Jeroboam in other sins in leading the people of Israel into sin. And so the ways of the Lord who had anointed him to become king is as if Jehu went against God's wishes at that time. Had he been a believer, we would have said he was a backslider. Back down in Judah, Jehoiada was a priest who was aware of this young boy, Joash, being hidden. And when the appropriate time came, when he was only seven years old, Jehoiada made a procession and gathered a bunch of soldiers for his protection. And they made a great celebration and announcement that Joash was to be king of Judah. When Athaliah heard about it, she hollered treason. But Jehoiada had Athaliah put to death and Joash became the king. And we read some interesting things from 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. Joash was seven years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba. Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. While Jehoiada lived, Joash made good decisions, and there was revival in the land. And Jehoiada took two wives for Joash and he had sons and daughters. So from this, we get the idea that what we're going to discover in next week's reading is that probably when Jehoiada the priest dies, after that, Joash will not make such good decisions. So stay tuned and we'll see if indeed that is what happens in our reading next week. So this particular week, we finished week number 22. And we're about halfway through or getting close to being halfway through our chronological reading. If we stay up with our pace, we'll finish on the 16th of November. So I encourage you to continue your reading and uh, hope that you enjoy these things. We want to look for opportunities to take scriptural principles from what we read in the Old Testament, make application of them to our lives in our day and time. One of the applications we could take from this week's reading is that Disobedience to God's will and not following God's man, which in our reading this week was the prophet Elisha, brings about consequences. Gehazi tried to be 
deceiving to his master, the prophet Elisha, and go behind his back to gain material things, clothing and money, when he was well aware that Elisha had told Naaman that God would provide for their needs and they did not want to be taking things from uh, foreigners. And there was consequences to that that Gehazi learned the hard way. And we can take that to heart in our lives. We understand the difference between right and wrong and especially if we read through scripture and if we have trusted in Christ as our savior, the Bible teaches us that God's Holy Spirit comes to live and to dwell within our spirit. We're actually referred to by the Apostle Paul as the temple of the Holy Spirit. So God's Spirit will help us to discern the difference between right and wrong. And we learn that there are consequences for knowingly being disobedient to God's will. So that's kind of a harsh and abrasive takeaway, but it's relevant to the truth. So we want to look for those principles to glean from the Old Testament readings to make application in our lives. So until next week, uh, hang in there and stick up, stay up with your reading. Father, thank you so much for these who join us online. I pray that you would bring them encouragement from your word. Thank you for them. I pray that you'd bless them. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Hope you have a great weekend. Enjoy fellowshipping with other believers. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, Lord bless you.